Hello and welcome to episode number 64 of the Scottish History Podcast. My name is Owen Innes and this week I'm going to be telling you about the archipelago of St Kilda to round off our UNESCO World Heritage Sites of Scotland little series that we've been doing. So please join me for episode number 64 of the Scottish History Podcast. So this episode is going to be a little tough for me, hence why I did leave it until last. Purely as I try to talk about places that I have been to and have actually experienced personally. But unfortunately, I have never been to St Kilda. But I will always, as usual, try my best with this one. So St Kilda is the last chapter in our UNESCO World Heritage Sites of Scotland series and there is a huge amount to talk about, so let's get started. St Kilda is an archipelago which lies 64 kilometres or 40 miles away from North Uist, uh, so that's not even on the mainland of Scotland, another island which is isolated in the Atlantic Ocean and consists of four islands. The main largest island is called Herta, which is 3.4 kilometres or 2 miles and 1 eighth from east to west and 3.3 kilometres or 2 and a sixteenth miles from north to south. So roughly about the same length as it is wide kind of thing. This is the island that the majority of its inhabitants lived on until their evacuation in 1930. Now why that was, we will get into that later. The other islands of the archipelago are Dun, which means fort, Soe, which means sheep island, and Bore. The St Kilda archipelago also features many large sea stack formations also and from the images I have seen it truly is a sight to behold. There is no direct answer for how St Kilda got its name. There is of course no saint of that name so it's definitely not named after one. The same as Herta, the most likely that I could find was that it probably means Westland from Old Norse. The archipelago is a result of a long extinct volcano and the land mostly consists of granites and gabbro style rock. The highest point of St Kilda is on Herta and is a sea cliff that is 430 metres or 1,410 feet tall and this is known as Conachair. The sea stack, Stakan Armin, is 196 metres or 643 feet tall and is the highest sea stack in the British Isles. Now we know that St Kilda was inhabited for at least 2,000 years, most recent reports are saying for up to 5,000 years before its evacuation going from the Bronze Age up to the 20th century. In 2015, Neolithic pottery was found along with other Neolithic tools and knives and that means then that it would be older than 2,000 years. No living structures, however, from these times were ever found. However, St Kilda was a hotbed of activity during the Iron Age. The first written record of St Kilda comes in 1202 when an Icelandic cleric took refuge here during a bad storm. During their time on the island, then referred to as Hartir, so H-I-R-T-I-R, which of course would probably more likely be Hurta, 
They found brooches, a sword made from iron, along with Danish coins. They also refer to place names on the island that indicate a very heavy Viking influence in the area. St Kilda was historically held by the clan MacLeod of the Isle of Harris and, of course, on the Isle of Skye at Dunvegan. In 1615, Col MacDonald of Collinsey raided Herta of 30 sheep and some barley. The MacDonalds and the MacLeods in this particular area never really got along. Uh, if you know a wee bit more about the history of that, then fantastic. If not, that is something that we are more likely to get into in later episodes. Something which I'm sure I promised a long time ago, not got round to it yet. In the early 1700s, St Kilda started receiving a lot of visiting boats. Unfortunately, the people on board these boats brought deadly diseases, such as cholera and smallpox to the island. In 1727, the loss of life to the St Kildans was so high that new families had to be brought over from the Isle of Harris to repopulate the island. By 1758, there were 88 inhabitants of St Kilda and 100 by 1800. In 1851, 36 islanders decided to emigrate to Australia, a loss that the island never truly recovered from. These islanders chose to emigrate partly as a result of the island's church being closed as a result of the disruption of 1843, which is again something that we'll more than likely get into properly in later episodes, and this uh, led to the creation of the Free Church of Scotland from just the standard Church of Scotland. So religion on the Western Isles is still a massive part of people's lives even still to this day. Certainly more so than anywhere else in, uh, in mainland Scotland, for example. Up until two years ago, you couldn't even buy fuel on the Isle of Skye on a Sunday. In 1705, a missionary headed to St Kilda to try and introduce Christianity to the islands. However, the idea of organised religion didn't really take on. That was until a man referred to as the Apostle of the North, a Reverend John MacDonald, arrived in 1822, where he preached 13 sermons in his first 11 days on the archipelago. MacDonald was well loved by the islanders and they even wept when he left in 1830. That year he was replaced by Reverend Neil Mackenzie, who along with preaching also helped reorganise the island's agriculture, building a new church and even setting up a school to teach reading, writing, arithmetic and held a Sunday school for religious education. Mackenzie stayed in St Kilda until 1844. Upon his departure, the school closed and a new minister wasn't appointed for another 10 years. Now, the St Kildans decided that after the disruption of 1843 that they wished to move from supporting the or move from the Church of Scotland teachings to the new Free Church of Scotland teachings. This led to the appointment of Reverend John Mackay in 1865. Now, he was more focused on emphasising religious observance to the point that the islanders actually hated going to church. It started affecting their routines. Uh, anyone who made noise during the service was lectured of dire punishments that would happen to them in the afterlife and children could no longer play games on the island and were to carry a Bible with them every place they went to. On one occasion, during an island-wide food shortage, a relief ship arrived on a Saturday. But Mackay told the islanders that they had to spend that Saturday preparing the church for the Sunday service. The food was not brought on to the island until the Monday afternoon. Despite this, Mackay remained as minister in St Kilda for 24 years. With the island being so isolated, life was rather unorthodox for the islanders. For example, after the Battle of Culloden in 1746, a rumour spread that Bonnie Prince Charlie had fled to St Kilda. So, of course, the government forces headed to the islands. 
The islanders believed that the incoming ships were pirates and not the government soldiers, so they fled the village and headed towards caves, where they hid. When the soldiers finally found the islanders, they found that they had never even heard of Bonnie Prince Charlie, or even the fact that the king was now George II. The main way, at that point, of communicating with the outside world, in a way, was by lighting a bonfire on top of Conacher, the tallest point of Herta, as I mentioned before, and hope that it would somehow be visible. Another way invented was what's called the St Kilda mailboat. This was an inflated sheep's bladder, which was then attached to a piece of wood that was shaped like a boat. Inside of that piece of wood contained either a bottle or a can with your message inside it, and that was then put into the sea during favourable sea conditions. Now this method meant that around two-thirds of these mail boats were found on dry land somewhere on the west coast of Scotland, and sometimes even less conveniently on the coast of Norway. Now the St Kildan's diet never really changed from its inhabitation, and really still until its evacuation, a real kind of hunter-gatherer style of living was in effect on the islands. The diet surprisingly didn't feature much, if many, fish, mainly due to the surrounding sea being way too rough to go out on and fish. So the majority diet was to feed off of the seabirds that nest on the island. These seabirds ranged from gannets to fulmins to puffins. As these birds settle on the cliffs, it was a tough task to go and collect your dinner. The islanders had to abseil down the cliffs using homemade ropes and in their bare feet. Now, another tradition that sort of existed around the cliffs was at a place that's called the Mistress Stone. This is a rock formation at the edge of a cliff that kind of looks almost like a door leading out over the side of a cliff. Now, this is where a young man would prove that he could essentially balance on the cliff with his left foot half over the cliff. His right foot was brought over the top of his left foot, um, kind of so standing on one leg, basically. Uh, he then must hold his two fists over the top of his right foot and then bow at the same time. And the tradition was that only then was he ready to get married to the most beautiful woman on the island. That's. I wish it was that easy, you know, just some kind of strange cliff-top yoga. In 1898 and 1899, a man called Norman Heathcote visited St Kilda and subsequently published the book called St Kilda in 1900. This brought tourism to the island for the first time. It also meant that islanders could sell their wares to the tourists, things like tweed and eggs, and things that they collected around the islands. But as before, the boats that brought the people brought disease, like neonatal tetanus, as well as something called boat cough, something that occurred whenever a boat seemed to arrive on St Kilda, but then this just kind of became a part of the life of the St Kildans. By 1906, the church building on the uh, island of Herta had been extended once again to feature a new schoolhouse, and here children were taught English as well as their native Gaelic. Despite regular food shortages and even a flu epidemic in 1913, the population of St Kilda remained at a sort of stable population of between 75 and 80 people. I believe that the maximum amount of people that ever lived on the St Kilda Islands was around 180 people. Now, at the beginning of the First World War, the Royal Navy built a signal station on the Isle of Herta, and for the first time ever, St Kilda could talk directly to the mainland of Scotland. However, on the 15th of May 1918, a German submarine fired 72 shells at the islands, destroying the signal station as well as the church, the schoolhouse and the manse. The only loss of life was one solitary lamb. Because of this attack, a four-inch gun was erected at Village Bay on the island in case the island was ever attacked again. It was never used and remains unused on the island to this day. 
During the First World War, the sense of isolation disappeared as ships regularly brought food and mail to the island. But once the war was over, the feeling of isolation started to return. And this led to a lot of most of the young, able-bodied islanders leaving St Kilda for a better life on the mainland. This led to the population of St Kilda falling from 73 in 1920 to just 37 by 1928. Now in January 1930, a young woman called Mary Gillies became ill with appendicitis and was brought to the mainland of Scotland for treatment. She died, unfortunately, shortly after in hospital. After this, the remaining islanders started to become fed up of being so far away from the mainland, so far away from things like healthcare, etc. So they decided to petition the government for the immediate evacuation of the island so that everyone on the island may live a better life. So the idea of evacuating the island actually came from the 36 remaining islanders. On the 27th of August 1930, a boat came and took all the cattle and sheep from the island so that these could be sold off. Unfortunately, however, the working dogs that were working on the island could not be taken and they unfortunately were drowned in the bay. Two days later, on the 29th of August 1930, a ship called Harabel took the 36 remaining inhabitants of St Kilda to Morven on the Scottish mainland. Before leaving, however, each home was left containing an open Bible, a pile of oats, and all the doors were then locked behind them. St Kilda remained uninhabited until the Ministry of Defence decided to include the islands in its missile tracking range in 1955. By 1957, people were once again living in St Kilda. A number of buildings were built as well as masts and even a canteen which is being dubbed the Puff Inn. Two separate words, P-U-F-F space I-N-N. I thought it was hilarious. Anyway... Although St Kilda technically does have people living there, it is mostly temporary, so its official population is still zero people. But there can be anywhere between 20 and 70 people on the island most of the time. Nowadays, the islands are cared for by Historic Environment Scotland. In fact, the Ministry of Defence pay rent to the Historic Environment Scotland to allow them to have their bases on the island. And Historic Environment Scotland have restored some of the buildings, including the church and the school hall, back to what it likely looked like in the 1920s. You can visit St Kilda, and I mean, I'm absolutely dying to do so myself, but it is by boat. And from the sources in which I've looked up, it can take two and a half hours on a very windy, choppy, open sea. Only for the hardcore traveller, I'd say. However, once again, I think I would absolutely love to spend a day on Hertha and see in this wonderfully historic place with my own eyes. St Kilda became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1986 and one of only 39 global locations to be awarded its World Heritage status for both its natural and cultural significance which it then gets grouped in alongside Mount Athos in Greece and Machu Picchu in Peru. So folks, once again, thank you very much for listening. That's this little mini UNESCO World Heritage Sites of Scotland series come to an end. Now, the next couple of weeks for me are going to be very, very busy. However, I'm going to endeavour to try and get something out at some point. Um, I'm going to be working for eight days straight and then I'm away on my brother's stag do almost immediately afterwards. I do have a one day swing in there, however, so I'm hoping to get another episode out before all of that. So it will be like I was never gone in the first place. So once again, folks, thank you very much for listening. If you want to get in touch with me for any suggestions, I'm now at the end of this little series. I'm going to start needing some new suggestions again. So send me them over. Um, Let's get some more interaction going. So if you want to interact, you can do it via the Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages. Just look for Scott History Pod on all of those. You can send me a direct email to scotthistorypod at gmail.com. 
Visit the website where you can catch up with all the latest episodes featuring your favourite player by going to scotthistorypod.com. And if you want to support me in any way financially, which is much appreciated but never necessary, uh, and I do wish to thank all of my most recent patrons for coming on board, but if you wish to support me, it is through Patreon, so that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Scott History Pod, and that just helps keep this podcast running. And uh, yeah, it is fantastic. Thank you so very much to everybody once again for listening. Take care and I'll speak to you again next time.